So our speaker today is William Huggins. He is an MBA and he also holds a Master of Philosophy in Finance and has been a lecturer with the DeGroote School of Business since 2018. Um, he's taught courses in finance, economics, and statistics within the MBA, MFIN, and undergraduate programs. And prior to this, he taught finance at the University of Toronto's Rotman School for 10 years, delivering over 140 courses and receiving numerous teaching awards. He has led international study tours on the history of finance in China, Italy, Germany, and the UK since 2013, and is deeply interested in the intersection of finance, history, and geopolitics, as well as ethical issues related to the allocation of resources. So we're excited to have him here today, and thank you again for everyone for coming by. It's always pleasant to get a nice introduction like that. So <laughs> good morning, everybody. It's nice to see you all. Or I see a panel of black boxes. Uh, but nonetheless, as some of you know me already, you've taken uh, MFIN 604 with me either this past fall or this past spring. Some of you will be taking MFIN 604 with me this coming fall. So it's good to see, or again, see everyone. Um, so what I'm hoping to do this morning or this evening, depending on where you are uh, in the world, is give you something a bit of an introduction um, to finance. That's part that may be a little bit more interesting um, than some of the introductions to finance that you've heard in the past. Um, the reason I got asked to speak today is because one of the many courses that I teach uh, at DeGroote is a course on the history of finance, which, oddly enough, turns out to be of interest to a number of people in the field whose education generally focused on how things got done, uh, as opposed to necessarily why they were done in that particular way. So what I have for you this morning, or this evening, again, depending where you might be, uh, is a potted version of global financial history which I hope will spark a bit of a deeper interest in what you will be learning over the course of your master's degree at Groot. <clears throat> now, this particular course uh, that I've sort of cribbed this from uh, isn't offered in the MFIN program, but if you're interested in the details or any of the materials, just contact me and I'm happy to share this with you. Without any uh, further ado, I've got uh, a few images that I'd like to kind of run with you to support the, the story that I'll be telling overall. Um, <clears throat> it's pretty straightforward, I believe. Um, so I've organized this chronologically, ultimately, because I think this is probably the best way for us to approach uh, this particular topic. But before getting too deep uh, into why it is that we should be studying finance or the history of finance is sort of what I want to discuss first. Um, the main reason that people want to study finance um, seems rather obvious to people who are in a master's degree in finance. Uh, ultimately, our discipline is about developing best practices for coordinating the flow of capital across time and space. Uh, you might think that sounds a lot like economics, but economics generally describes how people make trade-offs related to capital, whereas finance is a lot more about the tools that people actually use to get that job done. So it's worth trying to understand some of the details, right, where fine, our eco might simply assume that buyers and sellers get together and demand will match supply. Finance asks the question of, well, exactly how do they do that? What kinds of systems do they use to modulate their demand and supply to understand what the other counterparties uh, might be willing to come to the market with. So this is why we, we study finance. There, there's a, a real math reason is to make ultimately our use of resources more efficient and to try to drive society forward. But the next question, why study history, is not always apparent to people who are studying technical disciplines like finance. Right? Many of the people who end up studying a master's degree in finance uh, pursued a rather quantitative path uh, throughout their education. And as a result, they may have neglected to consider uh, some of the more important humanities studies like the history uh, of human civilization. And history overall gives us a bit of an idea about what path we followed to arrive where we are. There were some views of history historically that suggested that this was a, a straight line evolutionary path, that the course of events was simply driven by our natural destiny towards a particular outcome. But modern history has come to identify that really what we have is a path dependent series of events, that what happens at time t plus one largely depends on what happened in the period before that. So history allows us to understand why the world works the way it does in the modern period. It also happens to be a clever gold mine of ideas and reasoning that we might be able to use uh, going forward. It shows us how people tried to adapt to different kinds of situations, and that can afford us a lot of inspiration when considering how to tackle the kinds of challenges that we face as humans in the 21st century. So those two things combined give us a good reason to study in particular financial history. 
because this helps us to understand why we allocate or coordinate in the way that we do, which is really the starting point for any attempt to redesign or improve our existing techniques. So if we don't think the pensions are working for us, this is where we start. If we don't think corporations are working for us, this is where we start. If we wanna build a better bank or a better central bank, an understanding of financial history is really the first step in this ideation exercise. So one of the things you'll realize really quickly is that when we talk about financial history, we're talking about world history. It's the history of a suite of technologies and tools as opposed to the history of a particular people or a particular place. So this narrative doesn't so much glorify a particular conqueror or elevate a particular people to an a, a honored place in history. And instead what it does is it sort of rinses off most of the unnecessary identifying factors and focuses entirely on what people were doing and why they were trying to do those particular things. Now, interestingly enough, financial history is also somewhat a secret history of the world in that it isn't particularly widely known, despite the fact that it's provided the underpinnings of civilization since the very beginning. So in my opinion, it's important for us uh, to always keep focused on this idea of what our story is in terms of financiers. While a lot of people might tend to associate finance with say such a, <clears throat> distasteful characters as the Wolf of Wall Street portrayed by Leonardo DiCaprio, I would encourage you to uh, lean away the complete opposite direction from that sort of, um, how do we say, leadership figure. 99% of what goes on in finance is not the Wolf of Wall Street. And when that does happen, it's a bad thing, not a good thing. So part of my mission today is to help try to reclaim the heritage of finance as a bit more of a noble pursuit that enhances civilization and not simply a gallery of rogues. When we look around at financial history, there's a number of people who've really made the world better for a large number of people, right? Whether we're talking about Muhammad Yunus founding Grameen Bank or Wilhelm Raiffeisen who created the world's first credit union, King Gudea of Lagash who first forgave all of the debts in the city and freed all of the all of the slaves, whether it's John Bogle who has systematically managed to drive the cost of mutual funds in the 21st century into the ground, Wang Anshe, who introduced the Song Chancellor who introduced notions about the welfare state, or Cosmo de' Medici who helped to finance the Italian Renaissance. These are all financiers who have ultimately made the world a better place to some extent, as opposed to those who are simply selfishly serving their own best needs. <clears throat> so one of the useful things to think about when you consider the, the benefits of finance, which is not something normally people discuss outside of a classroom, it's worth noting that throughout history around the world, it's been repeatedly observed that the surplus is created by good financial and economic tools uh, <clears throat> usually end up producing a surge in cultural products in the generations that follow as artisans are suddenly afforded more resources during the good times. This takes place in classical Athens with the introduction of coinage, in Ptolemaic Egypt where both coinage and banking are introduced, in Song China with the introduction, uh, the introduction of credit, a cash <clears throat> economy for peasants and the creation of paper money, during the Italian Renaissance, during the Dutch Golden Age, the British Empire, and even 20th century America. Every time we see these waves of financial innovation that sort of improve the way that we can tackle our problems, we generally create more surpluses that enable us to finance the things that actually make life worthwhile. So this is an important way to understand what finance is about. Finance and economics makes life possible in a world where there's economic scarcity. But the art that is financed by the surplus we create, that makes life worthwhile. So a useful place for me to uh, start building up the base of why finance is important to you uh, is to consider the idea of what makes a country rich. So having taken this map from the 2019 Credit Suisse Global Wealth Report, it gives us an idea about the aggregate levels of wealth per capita in different countries around the world. Uh, and you can see that certain areas uh, seem to be conspicuously wealthy compared to others. And there's been a number of different hypotheses that economists have considered uh, over these decades about why it is that this particular distribution has resulted. So to just list off a few of the traits that people find important, the first one, of course, is good geography. 
If you've got good ports, you've got river systems, fresh water, uh, you are at an agriculturally friendly, temperate climate, you have plentiful resources, all the sorts of things that come with being on the right part of the map, uh, there are definitely advantages to this. Certain geographies uh, are naturally a little bit more friendly to capital formation than others. The next thing you need, though, is good demographics. I, what we'd call good demographics from an economics perspective is a small number of children and a small number of elders and a very large number of working age people, 18 to 65, that generate extra surpluses that can be invested as opposed to simply consumed. <clears throat> Next thing you need is the absence of, of war. Effectively, you need security. Wars always destroy human capital and infrastructure, and this can really slow down the rate at which wealth accumulates. So parts of the world like Canada that haven't experienced major conflicts in over 200 years are fairly wealthy, not only for its geographic endowments, but also for the security that it's enjoyed. And other important factors uh, include, as you might imagine, the rule of law, an efficient and impartial dispute resolution system, which gives people the ability to sort out their conflicts uh, and thereby have some idea about how a dispute might actually work itself out when trying to coordinate with large numbers of people. But finally, it's that last issue that I think really makes the difference, quite frankly. It's that well-designed institutions for coordinating people's effort. In other words, the suite of financial technologies enjoyed by the people living in a particular country. If they've got the right kind of institutional framework, it becomes relatively easy for them to save and channel their savings into productive enterprises that spread the gains of industrialization widely across society. But if we don't have well-developed de financial systems, then our economies tend to stall out around the mid-1800s. If that, you can industrialize marginally, but you won't be able to really create a wealthy, prosperous society unless you've got well-developed institutions and organizations, unless you've got a well-functioning stock market, pension plans, insurance companies. Achieving that level of prosperity that we see in some of the wealthiest nations around the world simply wouldn't be possible. Now, over time, what you'll see is that financial technologies uh, are developed and lost. People change their minds, basically, about what they find to be an acceptable way to solve certain kinds of problems. For instance, if we roll the clock way back um, to <clears throat> early human history, we see that interest first appears and disappears in ancient Mesopotamia. Public companies in the form of public and societies thrive during the Roman Republic period, but vanish under the Roman Empire. Paper money first appears in China uh, and then disappears just a, a few <clears throat> uh, centuries later, only to reemerge in the early 20th century. Public companies, again, make a big splash in early 18th century Britain but then find that for 105 years after the collapse of a bubble in 1720, that new public firms all required government approval, effectively stymieing any kind of equity financing uh, during the emergent industrial revolution. Now, importantly, some ideas that have been sort of canceled in one particular area end up re-emerging in other regions in some kind of modified form. And thus, the engineering lab of human society basically continues to churn out ideas prototyping and reiterating various concepts until we learn which designs are ultimately most effective. So let's have sort of a quick walk now uh, through some periods in human history. I've largely divided this up, you'll see, into six eras. The first I want to talk about is ancient finance, which is how we organized things uh, before we had writing. So we're talking about how humans organize themselves uh, <clears throat> going back to pe uh, periods of at least 5,000 years ago. Now, this story really begins with agriculture, uh, which first starts to appear at the end of the, at the, end of the last ice age. So about 12,000 years ago, humans start planting crops, not just living where the crops can be gathered, but actually planting and harvesting them. Now, <clears throat> agriculture unsurprisingly leads to food surpluses, which leads to larger population centers. Cities start to appear around 9,000 years ago. And of course, larger population centers ultimately lead to skill specialization by the people who are living there. And finance really gets started once the specialists need to exchange their output. It's one thing to note that in our town of 5,000 people that I have a rope maker and a blacksmith, and, but how do the rope maker and the blacksmith actually trade their output? What sorts of tools and techniques do they use uh, for coordinating <clears throat> what their crafts are and how much to produce? 
Now, well, the most readily available medium of exchange uh, was generally labor or grain because, well, agriculture had just started to produce so much of it. One of the interesting things we see is that many seaside societies around the world developed the use of shell money very early on. Things like labor or grain couldn't be counterfeited. And as it turns out, making a fake seashell was also rather challenging. Uh, so cowrie shells end up being used as a form of currency in a number of countries around the world, ranging uh, from the Pacific and Indian Ocean basins to uh, the North Atlantic and Pacific basins around North America. Now, you might say, well, I've also heard that, you know, we got to using gold and silver pretty early on. It's worth noting how we got to that. Um, copper mining starts around 7,000 BC, a uh, similar time to see the formation of the first cities, uh, because mostly people are looking to try to harvest metal to make better tools out of than the stone tools they were previously using. So as they get around to melting copper, they discover among the ores in copper, both gold and silver, which are relatively easy to separate out with the smelting process. About a thousand years later, we actually start directly mining gold and silver. Now, it's important to remember that when I say mining 6,000 years ago, about zero people uh, did that voluntarily, right? Mining in the ancient world is generally done by slavery. Uh, <clears throat> now, in the ancient world, in looking at places like uh, Egypt, and uh, we find that <clears throat> some people actually bound themselves into slavery in exchange for food and shelter. Remember, this is a world that doesn't provide for you in any way. In fact, it doesn't have many civilizations. So if you were... <clears throat> Uh, unable to feed yourself, you might actually turn in your freedom in exchange for security. Uh, and this is what we found uh, in, in the Old Kingdom in Egypt to some extent. Another technique that gets used for um, <clears throat> allocating resources between specialists uh, is a sort of symbolic proto-writing. You may have seen uh, early hieroglyphics, um, but what we call writing is specifically refers to sort of phonetic uh, alphabets or entire word concepts that can be readily understood. Uh, Proto-writing is not quite at that level, but nonetheless, they, we do see people uh, using different kinds of marked uh, symbols to represent different quantities or different concepts at this time, even though it's not particularly well developed. Uh, one of the things they did use uh, to keep track of uh, debts and the amounts uh, were these clay boules. A, a boule is basically a, an envelope made of clay. And what they would do is inside these clay boules, when there were two parties that were contracting, uh, they would put tiny little clay figures that symbolize different kinds of goods or quantities of goods. And then they would seal them in a clay ball marked with a date. So they would know when to break open the clay ball and you would have a physical counter of how much the two different parties owed to each other. In order to identify the parties, they actually sealed the outside of the clay balls, as you can sort of make out here, uh, with what they were called cylinder seals, impressing a unique mark that was held by each individual uh, as part of a sign of their contract. <clears throat> now, the other final sort of development that we see in ancient finance uh, are the beginnings of state granaries and later temples and palaces uh, that begin to position themselves as the main allocators of surplus in society. In this way, they effectively try to centralize capital flows and planning, uh, allowing people to exchange various kinds of goods in exchange for favor from the temple. If everyone remits some portion of their surplus to the temple, then the temple can reallocate that surplus in the form of rations to all of the different kinds of craftspeople uh, which are making their city economy possible. Now, a useful thing to note about these kinds of ancient world coordination systems is why it is that people got along like this in the first place. Because it's one thing to understand how your village of 150 people, it's all related by blood, gets along, <clears throat> right? And when we think about it, geneticists have been able to identify that uh, there is um, <clears throat> what economists would refer to as an untraded interdependency uh, between people who are related. Genetically, uh, we're basically a collection of genes that are self-replicating, and therefore our motives to have things like children are largely driven by our, the desires of our genes, desires, uh, to self-replicate. Uh, <clears throat> and this means, of course, that anybody that we're related to gives an opportunity for our genes to reproduce. Even if I have no children, my brother and sister may still have children, uh, and that allows my genes to, or the genes that make me my, up my identity, uh, to persist, provided I can help them, even if I have no children of my own. Uh, but beyond genetic links, people also affiliate along other dimensions of association. 
they exhibit loyalty uh, to people <clears throat> along other dimensions, regardless uh, of any apparent associated economic gain. Now, usually this involves ethno-linguistic groups or cultural religious groups, but we also see people banding together along national lines in the last 500 years, professional lines, and even into sororal and fraternal groups of choice. Uh, these bonds of association, whether they're familial or otherwise, often reinforce norms, customs, and behaviors, uh, which increase the predictability of other people's actions. This helps to reduce risk and encourages entrepreneurship. Now, these types of connections um, can basically form the, the, uh, well, the basis for what people today identify as fast trust. Fast trust is basically a heuristic uh, that we used for privileging people who are like us. Um, no kidding, our brains are hardwired up to look around, identify people that look like us, and then our sort of caveman brain presumes that they must be from our region if they look like us. And if they're from our region, probability is that we share some genes and therefore we should share some interests. <laughs> now, an interesting uh, layer on this uh, is the idea of co-religionists. I mentioned already that people might build links based on cultural or religious grounds, but when it comes to religion, uh, we actually see that this uh, pa, the community of the faithful effectively acts like a super extended family in terms of certification that it can offer to other members of the faith. Uh, and so as we start to develop very widespread religions, as opposed to simply local outfits like we have in the Sumerian people, what we find is that widespread common faith acts in the same sort of way that being part of the same family does. And it facilitates our economic interactions. It makes us more willing to trust one another, that I will be able to count on other specialists to deliver on their promises. So let's take a look now at what happens once we uh, do develop writing. In what we call the Bronze Age, <clears throat> uh, we see that people begin to not only use copper that they've been mining for 8,000 years, but they start smelting it in particular uh, with another uh, metal that they discover called tin. And this makes a huge change in human civilization because alloying tin with copper creates bronze, a material that is much stronger than simply copper-based tools that had been used prior to this, and hence the terminology, the Bronze Age. Uh, this is a somewhat worldwide phenomenon, but strictly speaking, the biggest change of this period, as far as finance is concerned, is about the introduction of writing. The first writing in human civilization occurs around 3200 BC, uh, and <clears throat> the emergence of writing gives us an immense amount of depth uh, in the historical record and shows us a lot of sophisticated details about what was going on. <clears throat> when we first start to look at some of the uh, early archaeology involving writing in modern Iraq, for instance, we were able to uncover a vast amount of old clay tablets covered in a writing style called cuneiform. Now it took some time for us to be able to decipher cuneiform, but once we finally did, it revealed some rather astonishing facts about the information that had been recorded on these ancient clay tablets. Looking at archaeological sites like Ur or Uruk, uh, what we've discovered is that over 90% of these tablets are financial records, meaning that these were kept for an immense amount of time and that people were able to refer back to them for centuries at a time. So it's interesting to note um, just what degree of sophistication we can observe in writings from this time period because it does give us an interesting in-depth look at the where exactly finance had proceeded to by various points in time. In particular, by about the 24th, 25th century BCE, so about 45 centuries ago, we have pretty clear archaeological evidence of liquid debts that are being resold among investors in markets. We have evidence of companies with dozens of investors, and we even have some evidence of banking where we've got entrepreneurs like Dumuzi Gamil who are borrowing from the temple of Inanna in order to extend loans to other entrepreneurs with the money that he's borrowed. By around 1750, we actually start to see, uh, BCE, we start to see some pretty sophisticated evidence, including this complaint letter to an entrepreneur from the city of Ur called Enazir. Now this particular complaint letter uh, has reached a strange kind of modern fame uh, in that if you were to just Google a Nazir memes, there are a ton of these. And I can't really explain to you why this complaint letter from 38 centuries ago uh, is of so much interest to modern meme makers, 
But nonetheless, <clears throat> the story of Ein Azir and Nani uh, has circulated rather extensively over the last few decades since the letter was first translated. This letter was found in the home of financier A. Nazir, and it complains about the quality of copper that's been imported on behalf of a number of his investors. His investors send agents to inspect the copper and are told by A. Nazir, if you don't like the, co the quality of the copper that I've brought here, you can choose to leave. And so, of course, Nani writes back to A. Nazir, decrying how he's been treated. And this letter, interestingly enough, was saved by a Nazir in his house to the point where we were able to dig it up 47 centuries later and see perhaps one of the oldest um, wolves of Wall Street, as it were, uh, from this ancient <clears throat> Sumerian period in finance. Now, another important aspect of this uh, is that math begins to enter uh, <clears throat> the picture during this period because people are effectively attempting to approximate exponential growth. What we see here is called the Drehem tablet. The Drehem tablet was discovered back in the 1940s, I believe, and once translated revealed that it was effectively a mathematical table multiplying out the expected population of a herd of cattle over time, given birth rates that had been observed. And what we have in this is the first real good record uh, of exponential growth, where we see the number of cows is expected to proceed along a fixed mathematical pattern. Interestingly enough, at this line right here, there's actually an error that gets made. There's a mathematical error that gets made in the tablet that researchers have since detected while doing their translation. So some grad student must have been particularly happy to discover this after rechecking it several times. But an interesting aspect of this um, has to do with the concept of interest. Interest is remarkably old and it effectively compensates in, uh, lenders for the possibility of default. And one of the things that we note in the Dram tablet is how much, how many cows I would expect to receive if I were to lend you my herd of cattle for a particular period of time. So for instance, if I lend you my herd of 100 cattle for a year, who gets to keep the baby cows? This is an important question, effectively. And the Sumerians address it in a very simple way. Their word for interest is mash, the same word that they use for baby cow. So literally the concept of interest in human history derives from the agricultural nature of what was getting lent out or borrowed. Uh, even today, if we take a look at in the Greek language, the word for interest, tokos, is also the word for birthing. <laughs> so this type of uh, early evidence of what interest is supposed to approximate uh, shows up starting in this period. But we notice that they weren't particularly adept uh, what they basically did is decided on a number of years that would take before the amount of the debt doubled, effectively capitalizing interest every few years once the amount had doubled. So you had straight line interest until the principal doubled, and then they capitalized that, and then they double it again every few years. They noticed that grain loans could be doubled every three years, and silver loans doubled every five. But another interesting feature uh, of <clears throat> ancient Sumerian debt uh, in the Bronze Age, that's not just in Samaria, I should point out, but also in Egypt and other civilizations at the time, is the ability to use one's own freedom as collateral on a debt. So this allows farmers to get started. It helps to people to finance trade. Uh, but unfortunately, if you fail to deliver on your promises, it results in debt slavery. Remember that the earliest things that we were trading were things like labor and grain. And therefore, if you borrowed a bunch of grain and were unable to pay it off, you were expected to work off your debt to the community that had lent it to you. Now, unsurprisingly, after a few centuries of this debt slavery technology, what you end up with is a massive society overwhelmed by the number of slaves with just a handful of controllers. And so this leads to destabilized societies, unsurprisingly. They, uh, 20 centuries before the rise of you know, uh, <clears throat> Roman gladiator Spartacus, uh, what we see uh, is the creation of a new Sumerian um, institution called the Amagi, or return to the mother. In the Amagi, what happens is uh, debts related to agriculture are entirely forgiven, and people who have fallen into debt slavery have their debts forgiven as well. Now, merchants who lost money don't have their debts forgiven, but farmers who fell into community slavery effectively uh, had their debts relieved. The first time we see this sort of event uh, is under King Gudea of Lagash, hence my inclusion of him uh, at the very beginning of my presentation today. 
But within a few centuries, by 1750 BC, we see that Hammurabi, the famous great Babylonian lawgiver, has actually included in his laws a provision on, uh, for bottomry, effectively protecting merchants and farmers who borrow against disasters like storms or pirates. <laughs> so moving on to our next era, starting around 1000 BC, we get what's called the classical period in finance. And in the classical period, uh, we see a few interesting things begin to emerge. One, metallic currencies begin to show up as a medium of, of exchange. Um, this is relevant because it's been, at this point, 5,000 years of mining. So we've developed enough idle metal, effectively, that we can start to circulate it as a form of exchange, as opposed to simply using it as a uh, carefully husbanded resource. The first kinds of <clears throat> metallic monies that we see uh, that are exchanged by people are in the Zhou Dynasty period uh, in <clears throat> classical China, uh, where we start to see the emergence of spade and knife money around 900 BCE. These were made of base metals that could ultimately be re-smelted down and used to reconstruct the knives or shovels, effectively the tools that they were meant to represent. So this was really a commodity form of money, because at the end of the day, if you had 10 knife coins, you could melt them down into enough metal to build a knife out of. Uh, <clears throat> but things, uh, I'll take a bit of a turn, uh, at the far end of the continent over in Turkey, or what was at the time known as Lydia, where they begin to mint precious metal coins. Uh, the particular region in Lydia happens to be have very rich gold and silver deposits, and so the mining that was taking place in that area yielded immense amount of this gold and silver alloy called electrum, which the Lydian king used to mint these world's first precious metal coins that you see here, uh, with the lion on the front and the two squares symbolizing his kingdom on the back. <clears throat> now, another interesting thing that occurs during the classical period is that we start to develop markets for capital, right? Uh, one of the early examples of this are the Athenian mining companies. In the Greek city of Athens, mining companies who are hoping to uh, <clears throat> operate in the Laurian region just south of Athens actually have to engage in a public bidding system with transparent pricing. And the people who end up allocating uh, the bids lose their jobs and are replaced on a regular three month basis to prevent corruption. Similarly, in the Roman Republic, uh, happening just one peninsula over from there, we see the formation of what are called societates publicanorum, which are effectively large public companies that have publicly traded shares. Both Greek historian Polybius and Roman Senator Cicero comment on exactly this uh, in their writings. Now, as a result of the formation of these kinds of market systems for allocating capital, one of the thing, important things that happens is that commercial loss is a very significant boost in activity during this period in order to help support uh, the businesses of importing food uh, into both Rome and Athens, which could not feed their own domestic populations. Around this period, or given about 600 BC, when the societates are just getting started and the Athenian mining companies are just getting started, we also see the appearance uh, of the first derivative contracts. Uh, forward contracts established by um, philosopher Thales of Miletus. The short version of Thales' story goes that uh, some of his friends uh, were mocking the philosopher that he was obviously so smart but not particularly rich that he decided to show them that he could become rich using philosophy. He applied his philosophy to study astronomy and the stars and made a forecast one year that the weather was going to be particularly favorable for the growing of olive crops. To take advantage of the bumper crop in olives he expected, he took out a contract where he rented all of the olive presses on his home island of Miletus and the island of nearby Chios. Therefore, <clears throat> thereby, if there had been a good harvest, all of the people growing olives would be forced to deal with him in order to press their olives into oil, um, meaning that he would earn outsized profits if his prediction about the weather was true. His prediction about the weather was wrong, he would have rented a bunch of olive presses that he couldn't rent out for as much as he had paid. And in this way, what we see is that Thales has a forward contract on the use of these uh, olive presses. And when his prediction about the weather turns out to be true, he makes himself spectacularly rich and stops working to continue being a mathematician, a doctor, and a philosopher. Now, interestingly enough, in the classical period, we also begin to see prohibitions on interest 
not just scolding by people who are concerned about how much interest is being charged. Under Deuteronomic law, uh, which starts to be uh, enforced around 620 BC, uh, the Jewish people are not allowed to charge one another interest. Their <clears throat> sort of uh, theological descendants, the Christians, uh, decried usury, but formal bans don't actually end up appearing uh, until the Middle Ages for them. Moving to the next period in medieval finance, uh, we start to see some interesting momentum beginning to emerge, getting us closer and closer to the things that we associate with modern finance. Um, in particular, in the medieval period, uh, we note that there is the rise of Islam. Um, now, Muhammad, um, the prophet of Islam, was a merchant prior to his revelations. So perhaps unsurprisingly, Islam introduced a series of new frameworks for finance during this period. You people were not allowed to draw profits from nothing. You could participate in the profit of a particular venture, but it was not acceptable to charge interest and to avoid taking on any kind of risk. Uh, we see the beginnings of a trust system called WACF that allows for collective ownership of particular assets. And we even see the introduction of mutualized insurance in the Takaful system. All of this emerges relatively early on in the seventh century uh, as Muhammad gets to work trying to find ways to uh, clean up the morality associated with finance. Remember that for thousands of years at this point, finance had been associated with things like slavery and debts and interest. And so there was a desire to sort of change the relationships between people that were embedded in finance at the time. Now, <clears throat> by this point, by about 800 AD, the Christians have finally gotten around to banning interest. Holy Roman Emperor Charlemagne uh, tries to ban interest across all of Christendom. Uh, and he succeeds for a little while, but ultimately the demands of commerce uh, in <clears throat> early Europe uh, begin to outstrip the capacity of it to be financed without the use of capital flows that necessarily imply the use of someone else's capital and using it for some time bringing us back full circle to the Sumerian idea of charging interest for the use of agricultural products. So <clears throat> even though the Christians tried to uh, ultimately keep interest down, they found that they were not really able to. And by the <laughs> middle of the Middle Ages, uh, what we find is that interest on loans is available to uh, Christian entrepreneurs, uh, both either as lenders, if they didn't mind the stigma of collecting interest, uh, but also to financiers who are looking to raise capital for their companies. Now, in particular, uh, we see a very strong hotbed of financial activity that develops in central and northern Italy in the period from about 1200 to 1500. During this time, a number of <clears throat> uh, specialty or uh, organizations begin to emerge, as well as some of the tools necessary for managing long distance finance. Uh, during this period, we see what are called the creation of the Italian super companies. We've got international firms operated from Florence that are, have offices located thousands of miles away. Uh, they've got foreign exchange risk that they attempt to coordinate. Uh, these super companies all develop internal captive banks to manage their capital flows. They worry about agency costs and how to carefully monitor uh, the people allocating their funds who are on the other side of mountains and across river valleys. And of course, they get involved in political risk management, with some of them literally vertically integrating with their own state in order to ensure that there wasn't a lot of pressure brought against bankers from on high. During this time period, we see a number of important figures uh, emerging. For instance, Leonardo of Pisa, otherwise known as Fibonacci. Uh, his part, even though everybody knows Fibonacci from his famous sequence, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, uh, what he is perhaps most important for in financial history uh, is the development mathematically of the time value of money, which he presents in a textbook. Uh, his textbook that gets published in the late 1400s is often referred to as a mathematics textbook. But strictly speaking, in 24 out of 28 of his chapters, all of his examples are finance. So uh, Leonardo of Pisa or Fibonacci's real effort is to try to provide business math education to the emerging nobility class um, that are becoming the international, uh, Europe's international bankers. During this period, we also see the first insurance contract showing up in Genoa, as well as the world's first central bank in the form of the Bank of St. George. So there are a number 
of <clears throat> Italian bankers and entrepreneurs in this period who make an important splash on the world. Whether we're looking at Orlando Bonsignore, who is referred to as the Rothschild of the 13th century, or Cosimo de' Medici, who single-handedly bankrolled the Italian Renaissance with profits from the Medici Bank, uh, <clears throat> we see significant amounts of improvement in the tools being used here. It's not so much that they are new tools so much as uh, they are significant improvements on an ancient suite of tools that we have long used. Now, not to be outdone, uh, we, let's take another swing back across the entire Asian continent uh, to talk about uh, Sung China. During this particular period in the medieval era, uh, China was particularly wealthy. Uh, during the Sung dynasty period, from about 900 to uh, so for, from about the late 9th century to the early 13th century, uh, China undergoes a, part, a financial renaissance that makes it particularly wealthy. So wealthy, in fact, that the 10th Song Emperor, uh, Gao Zhong, actually considered funding the entire state with the profits of seaborne trade rather than taxing the people at the time. Uh, it's worth noting that the Song Dynasty also introduced the world's first circulating paper currency that you can see here. Their ancestors, the Tang, had developed the idea and used these feikians to some extent, uh, but the Song had rolled it out at a national level, making paper money, as you can see here, the Jiaozi, uh, as being the first example of it, <clears throat> uh, being ultimately a uh, parallel, cur cur uh, parallel currency that circulated alongside metallic coins. Another interesting uh, figure from this same period uh, in China is, China is the Chancellor Wang Anshe, who introduced a number of government programs upon his ascent to the chancellorship in 1069, with the goal of spreading the gains of China's financial renaissance much more widely across society. Let me quote him here. Wang Anshe said that good organization of finance is the duty of the government and the organization of finance is nothing else than the fulfillment of public duty. The state should take the entire management of commerce, industry, and agriculture into its own hands with a view to succor the working classes and prevent them from being ground into dust by the rich. If it sounds like he was born in the wrong century, it's probably true. He would have found himself just as comfortable in China 900 years later. Interestingly enough, uh, officials pushed him out of power uh, when a large drought in 1074 caused losses on state loans that had been made directly to farmers. And unfortunately for the Sung, uh, all of Wang Anxia's innovative policies that we would today recognize as a foundation of a modern welfare state uh, were all repealed, unfortunately, by 1085. The next big jump, as you might imagine, happens in what we call the industrial period or the exploration era, if you're from uh, European, ranging from 1500 to, well, about 1970. During this time, a lot of things changed around the world. In the last 500 years, we've seen colonization, industrialization, electrification, flight, and mass sanitation. Around the world, mortality fell and life expectancies rose. So global populations exploded. And in the background, Finance was busy making much of it possible. The biggest gains in finance in this period resulted from advances in statistical sciences. People like Christian Huygens or Pascal or Demoives made dramatic advances uh, during the 1700s in what we would today recognize as statistics, which ultimately became the foundation of our understanding of risk in the modern world, giving us vastly more precise estimates of the kinds of risks that we faced when entering into certain kinds of financial contracts giving us the kinds of organizations we recognize today as insurance and pensions based off of our ability to estimate how long it was that people would live or what the magnitude of certain losses would be uh, given the historical record. <clears throat> so the work of early uh, statisticians uh, became actually fundamental to our understanding of modern finance. And it's during this period in between 1500 and 1970 that we make the most significant quantitative advances in finance, allowing us to get more and more precise estimates. But that's not the only thing that matters to us. The other aspect of, of this period that is particularly important for finance is broad public participation during this stage where we see enormous amounts of capital being mobilized by members of what we would call today the household sector. And then, of course, this allows the gains from those investments to be widely spread. So the key focus of, of this pocket of innovation was actually along the English Channel, 
um, in Amsterdam, uh, with what we today call the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a natural port. Uh, it's got a river and an ocean right next to it, and it's at the confluence of three different European trade networks, one from the British Isles, one from the Hanseatic League in the North and Baltic Seas, and the other one, the Italian and Spanish route, uh, running up the Atlantic coast. Once the Dutch had managed to free themselves from rule by the Spanish, uh, they lost no time at all moving into the international spice trade. By the time the Dutch get free of the Spanish by 1600, it's been over a century since the Portuguese have mapped a route around the, the Cape of Africa uh, and even crossed over into the Pacific by getting around the Cape at the bo bottom of South America. So the Dutch are well acquainted with the discoveries of the Iberian nations, and they want to muscle in on territories that the Spanish and Portuguese haven't necessarily locked down yet. And so in 1602, they create the Dutch East India Company which had over 10,000 public investors within the first six months, the majority of which were middle-class artisans and shopkeepers. Now, of course, if you've got a big major trading company with 10,000 investors, it doesn't take very long for you to develop a stock market, complete with brokers, short selling, and margin loans, all by 1610. By 1609, the Dutch have got a central exchange bank in their capital in Amsterdam, which is converting all the different currencies coming in from the different ports that the Dutch trade with into a single paper currency for local use. Now, the financially savvy Dutch are not uh, free of making missteps. In 1637, uh, they a derivative-based bubble in tulips inflates and bursts in the Netherlands. What's interesting about the tulip bubble is not just that, ha ha, uh, silly speculators lost their money on a dumb bet. What's important about the tulip bubble is that the Dutch at the time were the only nation trading with the, uh, the distant nation of Japan. And informed by the Dutch about the problems that had emerged over the prior 13 years with the tulip bubble, Japanese <clears throat> um, rice merchant Yodoya um, opens up a central clearinghouse that later becomes known as the Dojima Rice Exchange in 1650, uh, effectively modeling it as a modern futures exchange, making the exchange the central clearing party for both buyers and sellers of this single commodity. In the tulip bubble, there had been chains of forward contracts, which had led to disaster when the single parties defaulted, causing a chain reaction of defaults. But using the central clearinghouse system that dominates today's futures markets, these kinds of counterparty risks were substantially limited. And it's in Japan that we first see this sort of technology emerging, just 13 years after the collapse of the tulip bubble uh, in the Netherlands. Now, after the Dutch invasion of 1688, um, in what the British refer to as the Glorious Revolution, uh, the British end up creating a Dutch-style central bank, what we today know as the Bank of England, it cleaned up the national debt and began financing all sorts of ventures uh, that finally culminate in a stock market bubble in 1720. Uh, France had one at the same time too. You may have heard the terms of the Mississippi bubble and John Law, or you might have heard of the South Seas bubble. This is what we mean by the 1720 bubble uh, in the English Channel. Uh, it's worth noting that in, uh, in financial history, a particular thing occurs in 1720, uh, which is the creation of the first real insurance companies at the time which benefit both from scale of operations, which allows them to diversify risks widely, and improvements in math. By mid-1700s, we see the emergence of organizations like Lloyd's of London, based entirely off the quantification of risks that enables better pricing of insurance contracts. By the 1800s, these insurance companies are begin to sell life insurance to the public. Another use of corporations that we see that's particularly important during this period uh, is the use of colonial corporations by both the Dutch uh, and the English. They used corporations effectively to administer their foreign colonies, whether it's in Batavia or it's in New Amsterdam, uh, <clears throat> or we're talking about the Virginia colony, uh, the <clears throat> or Hudson Bay Company for that matter. In each of these cases uh, where corporations were used to administer foreign colonies, it led to disastrous consequences for the conquered people who were ruled effectively by profit maximizing enterprises. So again, there are some stains in financial history that we ought to be aware of, um, but this isn't to say that we can't make things better, harvesting the better aspects of uh, our, the dark history of corporations and trying to improve on this in the modern world, hoping that in the 21st century, we can avoid these kinds of historical disasters like the Belgian Congo Company 
uh, the ABR Congo Company rather, or the United Fruit Company in Central America. Now, <clears throat> by the late 1800s, as we start to get towards the end of the exploration industrial financial period, we see the emergence uh, <clears throat> of what we call the modern welfare state. Some company, uh, countries in Western Europe began to emulate Wang Anshu's notion that citizens would be more loyal if they were protected by the state rather than if we simply extracted taxes from subjects of the state. And so in order to try to retain some of its population who were busy packing up and leaving for America where there was free land, Germany actually introduces the first state-backed insurance plans for illness, accident, and old age in the 1880s, giving us the first state-backed pension plans, a model that's quickly copied by others. England follows Germany down this path in the 1920s, as does Japan in the 1930s. Canada got started around 1915, but our programs were particularly modest. They were part really expanded into the sorts of things we recognize today uh, in the period of 1950s and 60s, at the very end of the industrial age of finance. And where this leads us now is at the tail end of this timeline, you'll notice at the top, into the age of computerized finance. By far, the most important change in modern finance has been the introduction of computers. We could do the math before, but now it's being done much, much, much faster. This makes statistics reasonable and facilitates procedures like risk decomposition, portfolio optimization, and later machine learning. Computers have enabled the internet, effectively paving over the information asymmetries that used to plague finance in the past. Today, you can send funds, make payments, buy insurance and trade securities with your cell phone, which incidentally can also access more information than has ever existed in human history. And yet somehow people still believe the crazy stories they hear on the internet. In the modern era, we see a number of things changing with the result of computers. Insurance companies have automated away some of their underwriting, uh, and some firms even adjust claims based off photographs, including satellite imagery. Lenders have started to vacuum up vast amounts of loose data, uh, such that they can assess credit scores better than ever, improving both access to credit and product matching between financial service firms and their clients. <clears throat> Where banks, institutional investors, and white shoe investment houses once dominated allocation in the prior financial age, in just the last two decades alone, since I was an undergrad, computers have unleashed on us crowdfunding, robo-advisors, peer-to-peer lending and payments, gamified trading apps, blockchains, and have put both global news and sophisticated information at your fingertips. The world is changing dramatically fast. The financial world that we knew from the early 20th century doesn't really exist anymore. Now we see, for example, the most successful fund, uh, investment fund in human history is, was established by a physicist, uh, something, uh, the kind of <clears throat> profession we would not have traditionally expected to dabble in financial markets. We see that stock exchanges, once meeting places where individuals would gather to share rumors about distant voyages, perhaps whether at the uh, Five Bills Plain in Amsterdam or in front of the Temple of Castor and Pollux in Republican Rome, all of that social interaction has been replaced by the dry hum of computers as we simply meet digitally and co-locate using our phones and computers in order to conduct the affairs of modern commerce. A lot of weird things have come down the pipeline, and we don't really know how weird things are going to get. Uh, we're now moving into largely uncharted territory once again, in the same way that we saw dramatic changes once we introduced things like writing or statistical sciences, we should expect that computers are ultimately going to upend the way that we do finance in the modern world. And not soon enough, because our future is complicated. In the next 80 years, we'll be dealing with global demographic inversion, ecological collapse, and significant resource constraints, all of which are arguments for us to try to get more out of what we have with less of an impact, and thus the need for better and better financial tools. Now, the history of finance is really the story of the tools we developed so that specialists could more efficiently coordinate and exchange their efforts. Uh, there's a lot of different branches to the story of financial history, and there's a lot of interesting stories which grow from them. But this session was only supposed to last an hour, and that gives me five minutes to wrap this up.
So if I had to summarize the lessons of financial history, um, they would be the following. Number one, affiliation is the secret sauce that makes this work. People's shared sense of identity allows them to coordinate. And therefore, I give, we may ultimately need to find ways to enhance our sense of affiliation with people that don't look like us, aren't our co-religionists, and aren't from our nation. Number two, markets improve efficiency. The competition of people in financial markets ultimately leads to the generation of more surplus, as any basic macroeconomic surplus calculation can demonstrate. Um, by offering competitive opportunities, we also create innovation in markets, giving us the kinds of <clears throat> thousand points of light or the thousand uh, spring shoots uh, that will, which although many will fail, ultimately provides us with the opportunity to develop better opportunities and better systems. And thirdly, quantification helps. Uh, since the early Sumerian period where they attempted to quantify the impact of exponential growth on loans uh, to the development of things like <clears throat> um, Gaussian-based option pricing models, quantification has drastically improved our ability for precision and the ability to sort of grind an economic edge and get just a little bit more output out of the resources that we have, what we would otherwise refer to in economics as efficiency gains. So what does all of that mean once we put those three things together? Given the problems of the 21st century, it may be that we're gonna require some kind of broad sense of common affiliation so that we can generate the necessary degree of coordination and burden sharing. Hopefully, computers are gonna help grind out enough efficiency that the species will be able to reduce its resource footprint while continuing to spread prosperity across the globe. Neither of these outcomes is a given, however. And if we simply hope that somebody else solves the problem, we're much more likely to encounter a dark end than a bright one. So it's important for us, who are uh, those people who are studying finance, to not just worry about delivering on EPS, but to really focus on how we can improve these systems, make them better, and design a more prosperous future for all. And for the, with this, I want to leave you on a particularly uh, insightful quote <clears throat> uh, from the second president of the United States, John Adams, that should hopefully give some idea of why it is uh, that you should study finance and history. He states, I must study politics and war, that our sons may have the liberty to study mathematics and philosophy. Our sons, your generation, my generation, ought to study mathematics and philosophy, geography, natural history, and naval architecture, navigation, commerce, and agriculture in order to give their children a right to study painting, poetry, music, architecture, statuary, tapestry, and porcelain. Always remember, finance and economics makes life possible, but it's art that makes life worthwhile. And it's our job as financiers to create that surplus that makes life worthwhile. So hopefully this has been an interesting presentation for everybody. I see I've managed to nail it down to almost exactly one hour. So I wanna thank you for your time today. Uh, and like I said at the beginning, if any of this is of interest to you, I do teach an entire course on this, all, all on this matter. It's not offered in the MFIN program, but I'm happy to share materials with you if you reach out to me. Either you already know how to get hold of me because I taught you 604, or you'll be taking 604 this fall and I'm pretty easy to find. Thanks very much, everybody. Hope this has been an interesting talk for you. And um, yeah. I'll see you in stats class. That's well, great. Well, thank you so much, Will. Thank you, Will. Uh, just echoing Maddie's uh, uh, comments. Uh, I, this is really a fascinating talk. Uh, I, uh, although, as you know, I've been doing a little bit of reading myself in in this area um, uh, to to have a live presentation really helped to put things together. So, uh, thank you very much on behalf of all of us. That's More it. than welcome. <laughs> Yes, thank you so much. And thank you for everyone for joining us. We will be having another speaker series next month. We're just kind of nailing down the details for that. So keep an eye on your inboxes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Well, thank you all. And uh, for those of you who are either teaching or uh, of, uh, studying this summer, uh, I hope everyone has a good summer. Thank you.